Good morning. Uh, as we get started, a few announcements. Uh, we have um, next Sunday, the youth are going to get together um, in the evening. And, oh, you have an insert in your bulletin. Um, and on there, there's a spe special number for the UMCOR um, special relief towards Hurricane Ida. I'm sure you're all aware of what's taking place. And Methodist UMCOR are really good about being there and being there until everyone else is gone. So. Um, let's help support the, them in that crisis over there. And in their report there, it didn't even say anything about the lives that were lost in New Jersey and New York um, and the flooding that took place other places. But that advanced special is specifically for North America disaster area, so it will cover all those things. Um, uh, other announcements to share or thing, other things for the benefit of the community? Greg and I just wanted to make a quick announcement about Henry for everyone. Today's a very hard day for the Bacchus family. They have to make some very hard decisions and, uh, about taking him off the respirator and discontinuing his medications except for pain. So we would like for everyone to really be in prayer for Teresa and the boys and the things that are coming in their future after today. So please be in prayer for the Bacchus family. We all love them very much. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And what's, how about we just um, pause for a moment and have a prayer together. Um, I invite you to um, raise your hand up. Uh, we, instead of, we can't lift pat our hands on Henry now, but let's um, lift our hands up and send our prayer and love um, to Henry and the family. Join me in prayer. Holy and gracious God, we come to you in a time of uncertainty and feeling helpless. Fall afresh on Henry and Teresa and the whole family and the doctors that they may know your presence, know your peace, and know your wisdom. That we know that you do all things for good and eventually. Help us see the good. Help us to shine our lights for you all to see for Henry. Holy God, it's in your precious name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Today our focus uh, continues in worship, and we were talking about how we respond in worship um, throughout the rest of the week, worshiping all week long. So now let us go to God in prayer. Holy God, thank you for your presence here. Thank you that you guide us and lead us and give us strength and fill us up so that we can go forth to let your light shine in the world for all to see. Amen. Amen. Please stand together for our gathering hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy. Please remain standing for the call to worship. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. Come, continue on the journey. It is not far now. 
God is welcoming us to God's kingdom. We will see it in the faces of those who know God's love. It has already been given in his name is Jesus. He is God's beloved son, our light, hope, and salvation. Day by day, God leads us. To the beneath leafy pools of peace, to the green lush lawns of grace. Day by day, Jesus calls us. To pour out ourselves in service, to the one the stranger with God. Day by day, the Holy Spirit shows us. Please remain standing for the next hymn. And you've been standing for a little while, so if you need to sit down, that's okay too. Just keep singing, sitting down. What if we have in Jesus? What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. Please be seated. If you will join me in the opening prayer. Lord of love and light, shine through our darkness, bringing us hope. Open our hearts to hear your word for us today. Open our eyes to your light that shines in us. And open our spirits for the peace which you bring. Fill our mouths with laughter and speech with shouts of joy, that we may reveal the love which you surround us. Teach us and lead us, O God, forever and everywhere, to be alive and on fire with songs of gratitude, words of wisdom, words of compassion, deeds of justice, acts of kindness. Holy God, draw us close and fill us with your spirit. We offer this prayer in the name of the one who is our hope, love, peace, and joy. Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning. Hello. 
I'm glad to see you. I hope you love my love. I hope you enjoy my lovely jewelry today. Do you like it? Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, there's a lesson to be learned about snakes. And that is that you may have seen this before, but did you know that when snakes start growing, they get too big for their skin? And Logan, can you tell explain to us what happens after that? After they um, get too big, they grow their skin out and it comes off of them and they grow new skin. Thank you. And what happens to you kids when you start growing and your shoes no longer fit and your clothes no longer fit? Um, you buy new shoes? Yes. Landon? If snakes get too tight for their skin, they go new skin. Thank you. Well, you know, as we grow and we learn more about Jesus, sometimes we notice that we've done something wrong in our past, and we wish we wouldn't have done it. Have any of you ever had that happen, where you wish you wouldn't have done something bad? Never. Well, that has happened to me when I was a little kid and when I'm an adult. And sometimes I feel bad and I just want to shed off that skin that, and get something new. And in our Bible verse today from Corinthians, it is telling us that if anyone is in Christ, you are a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. So just like the skin off of the snake, the old is gone, you ask God to forgive you, and the new skin comes on. Will you pray with me? Dear God, please help us to shed off the old skin. Help us to leave behind anything, anything that we've ever done to hurt someone. Let us take on our new skin with Jesus Christ. Amen. First scripture reading today is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 11 through 28. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. So encourage each other and build each other up, just as you are already doing. Dear brothers and sisters, honor those who are your leaders in the Lord's work. They work hard among you and give you spiritual guidance. Show them great respect and wholehearted love because of their work and live peacefully within each other. Brothers and sisters, we urge you to warn those who are lazy, encourage those who are timid, take tender care of those who are weak, be patient with everyone. See that no one pays back evil for evil, but always try to do good to each other and, and to all people. Always be joyful, never stop praying, be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Jesus Christ. Do not strife with the Holy Spirit. Do not scoff at the prophecies, but test everything that is said. Hold on to what is good. Stay away from every kind of evil. Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. God will make this happen, for he who calls you is faithful. Then, dear brothers and sisters, pray for us. Greet all the brothers and sisters with Christian love. I command you in the name of the Lord to read this letter to all the brothers and sisters. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Please join me in our hymn of preparation. Lord, I want 
to be a Christian in my heart, in my heart, Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart, in my heart, in my heart, Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart, Lord, I want to be more loving in my heart, in my heart, Lord, I want to be more loving in my heart, in my heart, in my heart, Lord, I want to be more loving in my heart, Lord, I want to be more holy in my heart, in my heart, Lord, I want to be more holy in my heart. To be like Jesus in my heart, in my heart, Lord, I want to be like Jesus in my heart, in my heart, in my heart, Lord, I want to be like Jesus in my Yeah, so that word worship, um, I think for me, it is literally understanding the word as it's composed, right? This idea of understanding how the worth of God, right? And responding in every way possible to that worth, right? I tell people, if I told you I was gonna give you a million dollars, your wallet wouldn't be the only thing that jumps because of the worth of the amount of money, you're gonna jump, you're gonna scream, you're gonna holler, you're gonna shout, you're gonna do whatever, right? But it's a full body, full life, full soul response because you understand the worth and the value. And I think that's what happens when we understand the worth of God and the worth of people is that everything changes. Like we respond in our academic way, we respond in a, you know, a mental way, we respond physically, we respond socially, we respond with just living and justly and righteously, everything changes when we come in contact with God and understand the true worth of God and God's creation. So worship is all about a, a right response, a full right response. Some people, if you only respond in one way, then you haven't understood the worth, right? If your response to God is to have a church service, then you don't understand the fullness of God, right? If your response to God is just action and it's not like contemplation and meditation, do you understand the word of God, right? If it's just prayer and it's not action as well, do you understand the word of God? If it's singing and clapping and dancing, but it's not reading and, and being academic and thoughtful and, and really meditating on scripture, do you understand the word of God? It's all of that. So the way we treat one another, the way we treat um, creation, the way we respond to, to injustice in the world, all of that is about understanding how worthy God is of our response and, and value and worth and all those other things. So to me, worship is really about our right response or our, to me, it's like our, I don't even know what word to use. It's like a mandatory response to understanding who God truly is. And it's a response that I think the church has minimized to songs and clapping and playing musical instruments when really it's, I mean, I think it's about how we live throughout our entire life. Like we worship God through how we love our neighbors. We worship God through how we respond to injustice. We worship God through how we speak to power. We worship God to how we are, are prophetic in our talk about um, uh, through the world and, and, and creation care and, and, and loving our families and how we deal with education and inequitable school funding and how whatever we do, Right? When we sing our songs, when we come together as a unit, you know, when, we, when we value diversity and when we deal with our issues around race and prejudice and when we do all of those things, all of those things are a reflection of, man, I came in contact with God and everything changed. Everything. And um, 
to me, that's what worship really boils down to, is an interaction with God that causes everything to change. That's your reaction. Like, nothing stays the same. You don't think the same. You don't talk the same, right? And when you go back to the way you used to talk, it doesn't feel right, right? Everything changes. So um, I think that has been helpful to me because it's helped me to realize uh, why Christian community development or even like living this, this, this idea of presence out is so important. It's because that's a huge part of who I am. And so therefore worship is bringing myself to God in humble sacrifice. You know, it's that Romans 12, right? right? It, it's my reasonable act of service to bring my whole self as a living sacrifice to God. Every aspect, right? And that is far more difficult than just coming to church and singing some songs. But it's far more necessary because that's what God requires. Our second scripture comes to us from 2 Corinthians 5, starting at verse 16. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. And see, everything has become new. This is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation that is in Christ God was reconciled, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ since God is making his appeal through us we entreat you on behalf of Christ. <clears throat> be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made himself to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> we gather each week. We stop and remember that our worth is not in what we do. We stop to honor the Sabbath because God has commanded us to do so. We gather as people of God to give thanks and praise for all that God has done for us. We attempt to empty ourselves of the busyness of the week. We gather and we remember our family story, our faith story from the Bible, stories of God's love and God's people that have been passed down through the ages. We gather. We seek guidance from our participation in God's work in the world. Each week, the word is proclaimed, and we dive into the scriptures to seek a message from then for now. We hear the word, and the word is proclaimed, and we receive the word, and we drink it in. We drink in God's grace, and we are filled, and we are transformed. And then we are compelled to go out and live it out, because love in your heart is, wasn't put there to stay. Love isn't love until you give it away. And so we're sent forth as renewed creation, as ambassadors for Christ, as agents of God on a mission to shine our little light in the world to see. And that's where we are today in our series on worship. Today, our focus is on the fourth movement of worship, sent forth. And for simplicity's sake, I've broken this up into two sections for this week and next week. The two sections are often John Wesley described our Methodist founder used the terms personal holiness and social holiness to describe the inward growth of the love of God and neighbor, which in turn leads to outward works of love. Through service and prayer, we grow as disciples of Jesus Christ. Following Jesus' example, we, are sh we show compassion through our presence and our words and our actions. Transformation happens when the inner and outer life are aligned in right relationship with God and with oneself and with others, with all creation. In 1 Thessalonians, we heard Paul say, life should be joyous and prayerful, spirit-filled, prophetic, and tested. 
how that looks is going to differ according, depending upon what individual's life history and context. The question Paul is really asking us to consider is what is a life worthy of God? What is a life that is a faithful response to the gospel? What does that look like? And I think that's a question that isn't often asked. In the book Unchristian, David Kinneman, president of the Barna Group, discusses some disheartening research he found concerning the failures of Christian in our day to remain distinct. He says, in virtually every study we conduct representing thousands of interviews every year, self-described born-again Christians, which means people who say that they've made a personal commitment to Jesus Christ and that that's an important part of their lives, much more than other people who just claim to be Christian, fail to display much behavioral evidence of transformed lives. He continues by saying, for instance, based on a study released in 2007, we found that most of the lifestyle activities of born-again Christians were statistically equivalent to those of non-born-again Christians. When asked to identify the activities over the last 30 days, born-again believers were just as likely to have visited a pornographic website, to take something that didn't belong to them, to consult a medium or a psychic, to physically fight or abuse someone, to have consumed enough alcohol to be considerably legally drunk, to have often to have used illegal drugs, non-prescription drugs, to have said something that to someone that was not true, to have gotten back for someone that something that he or she did, to have said mean things behind one's back. Lots of lists there. If this study is right, then our really real life daily lives in many cases, are no different than anyone else. There's someone's behavior who says they're not a born again Christian, someone who doesn't. In the light of that, what does it mean to live a life faithful to the gospel? In many ways, there's very little literature to help believers reflect and discern for his, herself or for his self on the best way for an individual to live a life, a well-lived life and a Christian life. To be sure, there is an overabundance of literature telling readers how to live, prescriptions for what people should do is what I call them. But when Paul himself and the scripture is, of course, more than capable of doing that himself. What is needed is something different. It's an invitation to a profound reflection on the Christian life. Paul implicitly, implicitly offers the invitation here in the scripture. Paul cautions us about how a life in Christ should be lived out. He tells us, not for its own pleasure or even for its own glory of its own accomplishment, but solely in the hope of the future secured faith in the love of God and Jesus Christ. Paul also gives an explanation of how the people in Thessalonica and ever after are to manage to live such a life. The answer he gives is that we cannot do it on our own. Faithful is the one who is calling you who will do even this. And it is God's faithfulness, not our efforts, who makes such a life possible. So if this is something that you try to do in isolation by yourself, it's most likely impossible, I think. Paul's counsel speaks to the 21st century lives of ours that are broken and fearful, to people who are struggling to be the people God has called them to be. And this is the reason that Christian communities of faith exist. The church is like a 12-step program for recovering sinners, yet remain sinners, just like an alcoholic is still an alcoholic 20 years after they haven't had a drink. Often, our inclination is to distrust those who have been wrong, who've wronged us and to build security walls higher and stronger, to separate ourselves and protect ourselves away from that perceived threat. Paul's openness, vision, vision of openness is based on a triad of faith, hope, and love. And he speaks to us today. Imagine that a Christian life, a life worthy of God, is like a three-legged stool. First, we might imagine and might say that those who are called to serve, that is, if we can express thankfulness in all things, then we can say yes to our current context, and we can embrace the reality of our lives rather than living in conflict to it even if that's not a positive reality we live in. So the first leg is thankfulness in all things. Are you thankful? Second, if we can accept the notion that God uses every good thing, then we can enter that now, that current reality of our lives. 
This is not to say that God causes bad things to happen, but that God uses everything to attempt to lead us to the best possible outcome given the situation, even in situations that seem unbearable. The second leg is God is always leading us to the good, to the best possible outcome if we are listening. But that's the catch. We have to listen. Are you listening? Third, we discover in this process that God can make all things new. Rather than having all our doubts and disbeliefs about life quenched in the Spirit of God, we're able to pray, Help me, O God. Give me new eyes to see, new ears to hear, new mouths to speak your word. And when we do, we might see some things we might, would rather not see. We might see reality. If we see with God's eyes, we might see the subtle racism that's in our everyday lives. With God's eye view, we might see the reality of the abuse that's in our life or what life in the wake of abuse or infidelity or betrayal looks like. Something that is reality is often not something that we choose to see. The third leg is that God can make all things new. God gives us new eyes to see what is really real, truly, truly real, the way things really are and as well as the possibility of transformation to make all things new. To be sure, Paul encourages us that we should test everything. This real- reality testing is one of the primary ways the community of faith discerns that the power in us has originated from the Spirit of God revealed in Jesus Christ. With this kind of openness towards life, we can have curiosity rather than dread about the future of God's unfolding in the world. And most important, we are able to risk this day and the one after that in the sure, certain hope that the three-legged stool rests on a firm foundation. As it says, the one who calls you is faithful. And so we respond to the word proclaimed and are sent forth into the world to give thanks always, to listen to the promptings of the Spirit, to serve others, and to live transformed lives with God, with a God's eye view of the world so that we can let our light shine and live a life worthy of God. A New New Testament professor I heard of says in the reference to the song, This Little Light of Mine, he said, whenever he hears that song, it reminds him that early Christians during the Roman occupation of Jerusalem were suspended, Christians were suspended on poles, think crosses, and then lit on fire to illuminate the roads, the highways, during Roman parades. This little light of mine. That might reshape your thoughts on the song a little. This little light of mine. To say nothing of your commitment to the life worthy of God. Being a Christian martyr has been to the extent that some have been willing to go to let their light shine. This song, This Little Light of Mine, is one that I think has actually lost its saltiness. It's a song nothing against using it for children's times or children's Sunday school lessons, but I think it lessens its real meaning when that's the only time we use it because it has such a powerful message for us today. The phrase, this little light of mine, first appeared in 1925 in a poetry book by Edward Ivan. In 1933, a newspaper provided the first known reference to the song, reporting that a choir sang it at an African Methodist Episcopal Conference in Helena, Michigan. And here, listen to this version from 1939. Everywhere 
The refrain, this little light of mine, refers to the light of each individual and how, whether standing alone or joining together, each little bit of light can break through the darkness. After being recorded by several music groups, it became a popular anthem of the black civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. So imagine it's May 3rd, 1963, in Birmingham, Alabama. One of the most influential campaigns of the civil rights movement began with a series of lunch counter sit-ins, marches on City Hall, and boycotts on the downtown merchants to protest unjust segregation laws. The Public Safety Commissioner, Bull Connor, ordered the use of fire hoses and police dogs on protesters. Martin Luther King Jr. said that hundreds of arrests were made since the start of the Birmingham campaign. It marked the, a record for any single set, single event civil rights demonstration up until that point. <clears throat> With an estimated 40% of a student body at the all-black Parker High School skipping class to protest, that night someone started to sing, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine over the whole world, I'm going to let it shine. Sung while sitting in overpacked jail cells in the dark of night. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine over the whole wide world, I'm going to let it shine. Not going to let Bull Connor put it out, no. I'm going to let it shine. When we confront the darkness of this world with the light of Christ, it's a very powerful thing indeed. If we can connect this light metaphor with another one, you are the light of the world. We're invited to consider the role of disciples as we gather, as the gathered community. We see the power in the church can have in those protesters, letting their light shine against such evil. Light enables us to see things. It gives us color. It helps vegetation grow. Light, like disciples, as gathered community, have the overarching purpose of being a mirror that reflects God's light so that all people and all nations can know of God's love and justice and mercy. As a church, we are like a light when we engage others in the world. You are the light of the world, not a muted light set low enough that it doesn't glare, but a bright light, bright enough to illumine the world, bright enough to bring light to dark places, broken places of the world, bright enough to shine on injustice and to highlight where God is at work in the world around us. You are the light of the world, Jesus declares. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under a bushel basket, but a lampstand, and it gives light to the whole house. In the same way, light your light shine before others, so that you they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Don't put a basket over it in hopes that you can protect it from the draft, that you can shelter it from the strong winds of turmoil. The light must be held out for all to see and for others to see, which does indeed make us vulnerable, but it makes us visible. And yet we have to have faith that God will protect us in it, that no one, that the one that calls us is faithful. The purpose of the light is to illumine. In those days, lamps were small, yet dark one-room house in Palestine. Even small lamp gave light to the whole house. There have been numerous occasions when the idea of used to encourage someone to step forward, to surrender their shyness, and to come out of hiding. However, there's another reason to, for light to shine, for there is darkness in life, external and internal. And Jesus encouraged his followers to bring light to the dark and broken places of the world. The light is the light of the gospel, and it draws all people to its warmth and radiance. The mission has been primarily of the church from its very beginning throughout every age. In fact, Archbishop William Temple is often quoted as saying, The church is the only organization on earth that exists for those who are not members of it. In order for the light to see, we must be willing to go where the darkness exists, to engage and walk through it so that the, in time, the light can overcome it. This is why we have so many parables, parable after parable of Jesus going to outcasts like Samaritans and women and lepers and those who are sick. The author Annie Dillard writes, you do not have to sit outside in the darkness. If, however, you want to look at the stars, you will find that darkness is necessary. We must go to those dark places and 
bearer, the light of Christ for all to see. The light is not given for our own personal enjoyment. If I follow Jesus, who is radically different from the world, then I, in turn, am going to end up looking a little different from the world. If we will be light for the world, something that is different from the darkness that surrounds us, something that makes the world a better place, a place that looks more like God's kingdom. Often when people hear Jesus talking about being light, the light of the world, they consider themselves to be too small, too insignificant for such a task, such an overwhelming task. Instead of being overwhelmed with the vastness of possibilities of the ways to, for the world, to show the world that we are, we should just get out of our head and start to act. So we should start by making small baby steps. And yes, we will make missteps, but then comes the small course corrections that will in time get us to where we want to be, where we're called to be. What are the baby steps that you could make to shine in the darkness of the world, in the places of your world? We can look for opportunities every day to show our differentness as followers of Jesus Christ in ways that could shine light into somebody's dark world. As it says in Luke, in the first chapter, in Zechariah's song, by the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. If you are a Jesus follower and no one sees anything in you that is Jesus-like, what's the point? If you are the light of the world and take a break, are you being the light? That's why Jesus says that we are to let our light shine before others so that others may see our good works and give glory to God. We shine so others may see God. In the end, it isn't even really our light that's shining forth. It's all God. We only reflect it. Light is only useful when it enhances something or someone else. We as followers of Jesus fulfill our roles as disciples when we illumine the world with our actions and our words pointing back to Christ. As we do this, we're offering grace and hope to those who dwell in darkness and fear. There's a story from long ago of a very sickly child. One night he was sitting, he was especially ill in his second story room, and his home nurse found him with his nose pressed up against the frosty cold window in his bedroom. He was looking outside. She urged him to come away from there to get warm, but he would not move. He was watching and mesmerized by an old lamplighter. The lamplighter was walking slowly through the street of the town, lighting each oil light, a lamp on his way. The young boy told the nurse, See, there's someone poking holes in the darkness. Poking holes in the darkness. This is a beautiful way to think about our call as people of faith. We are not called to light the entire world, but rather to poke holes in the darkness. And if we all live lives, well, the darkness is going to start getting pretty weak. And we already know the end of the story, don't we? The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And so we're sent forth in the drama of our daily lives to live Christ as Christians, to live as ambassadors for Christ, as light bearers to let our little light shine wherever we go. Amen. Please join me in the hymn of response. It will be the last verse of Lord, I Want to Be a Christian. Lord, I want to be like Jesus in my heart, in my Lord, I want to be like Jesus in my heart, in my heart, in my heart. Lord, I want to be like Jesus in my heart. Will the ushers come forward?
Father God, you provide all that we need for a full life. As we bring our gifts to you today, remind us that through faith, our light will shine as we care for others through our actions and gifts. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. started with a great Thanksgiving. I just want to let you know I'm going to come through with individual communion cups and go make a zigzag through when we get through there. And also that the um, helping hands basket is in the back over there. So Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, all who seek to grow into his likeness and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us draw near to God. Let us join together in our great Thanksgiving. God be with you. Also Lift up your hearts. Let us give our thanks to the Lord our God. In the beginning, there was darkness, mystery, and by your word, you scattered the darkness with the light. You set a sky, radiant sunbeams of sunlight, and punctured the night sky with sparkling jewels. You forever changed our darkness. Holy God, though there was our shadows and worries in our life, you have placed your word in us as a lamp to our feet. And you have given your spirit like a bright guiding star. You fill us with your love as glorious as the sun. And you place your truth like a crescent moon. Every darkness is overcome with light. Every light contains shaft of your eternal light. God of sun and stars, we praise you with all the creatures on earth and all the company of heaven as we join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord. 
God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Ever present and ever loving God, you placed a star in the sky to guide your people from far and near to your child. Jesus is the light of the world in age after age and throughout all the world, drawing the lost and forgotten, the hurt and the wounded, the oppressed and the depressed to the wellsprings of life. He changed water into wine and called unheralded workers to be his disciples. He preached good news to the poor and healed the sick and beckoned the people to love their neighbor. By his baptism, suffering, death, and resurrection, he revealed the depths of your love and the power of light over darkness. On the night in which he gave himself up and gathered with his friends, he took the bread. He said, take, eat. This is my life broken for you and for many for their forgiveness of sins. Likewise, when the supper was over, he got the cup and he gave thanks to God. He said, drink from this, all of you. This is my life poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, in remembrance of God, grant and praise that we may be in a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable in your sight, and that our lives may proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine that through Christ's presence we may become beacons of holy light, sources of joy, a witness of peace. And may we be the body of Christ for the world redeemed by his life. O God of all mercy, remember those who suffered this day from injustice and poverty with no place to call home. Remember those who are sick, those who are imprisoned or troubled, and those who face death with no one comfort them. Remember those that we pray for even now that are in our hearts. We pray for Henry. We pray for Teresa and the whole family. We feel powerless to bring healing words of hope, and so we offer these prayers to you, O oh God. We place our trust in you, O Lord of all creation. We pray for Linda, Linda Brantley. We pray for Robin. We pray for Oliver. We pray for Linda. We pray for Brad and the Commonwealth family. We pray for Andrew. We pray for Aya. We pray for Ellen and Dina. We pray for John. And we pray for Linda. Holy God, fall afresh on us gathered here and on those that we've lifted up to you. May your peace surround them and be they may, may they be whole. Holy God, by your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until you come in final victory and we feast at that heavenly banquet together. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, and your Holy Church, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now we are bold to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Because we are one people, one loaf, many that we are, we're all one body, we're all take partake in the one loaf. Though we come to the table as hurting and broken individuals. It's through participation in the body of Christ that we find wholeness. Thanks be to God. The cup of what we share is a sharing the new life in Christ. And we drink in the blessings of God. Thanks be to God. The table is set, the feast is ready, and all are invited. And now I'll come around.
And now let us join together in the prayer after receiving. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we can go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now I invite you to stand as we sing our hymn of discipleship, this little light of mine. little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine all the time. Let it shine all through the city. I'm going to let it shine. Oh, little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine all the time. Let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine all the time. Let it shine all through the night. I'm gonna let it shine. All through the night, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Sing it, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine all the time. Let it Now let us join together our closing benediction. May the light of Christ's season shine in your hearts. Go in peace and may God's peace go with you. Amen. 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 Let us sing our closing song.
And now may the peace of Christ go with you, loving God and serving your neighbor in all that you do. Amen. And will someone in the back grab a trash can for all these things?